Hello, good evening. This is the All 24 News and coming back next to our program. <clears throat> Hundreds of protesters gathered in Portland to count them the decision to clock. Kyle Richards not guilty. Thousands of demonstrators of Australia and Netherlands against COVID-19 mandatory vaccination. Again in Africa, thousands of demonstrators blocked French convoy in Burkina Faso in a protest against insecurity and French army. Hello again and welcome. First in our top stories, Joe Biden has hailed the U.S. House of Representatives for passing a $1.75 trillion social and climate spending bill, a central plural of his agenda that must now go before the Senate. A Democratic majority, the House approved the Build Back Better Act on Friday, despite the first opposition from Republicans. Probably our reports. Biden signed into law the infrastructure package, which primarily allocates federal funds to repairing roads, bridges, tunnels, and other transportation systems, and has eventually traveled the country praising its benefits to voters. After an independent government agency predicted the spending measure would add $376 billion to the federal debt over the next decade, Nancy Pelosi, the Democratic Speaker of the House, announced that the lower chamber of Congress would vote on it. This agenda invests in long-term economic capacity and will enhance the ability of more Americans to participate productively in the economy. Stanny Hoyer, the Democratic House Majority Leader, informed legislators that the vote would be held on Friday morning after McCarthy invoked his privilege to speak indefinitely from the floor. This bill is truly for the people, not just those who have much, but those who have too little. Many Americans are looking at the investments this bill would make in America's workers and families and asking, how are we going to afford it? McCarthy slammed the legislation and the Biden administration in a four-hour speech that criticized everything from COVID-19 restrictions to migration at the U.S.-Mexico border. For nearly four years, as the House Republicans have been voicing the needs of millions of Americans, House Democrats have broken nearly every rule and standard in order to silence dissident and stack the deck for their radical unpopular agenda. Despite that the White House has insisted that the bill would be fully paid for, moderate Democrats have raised concerns that the package will increase the debit while many Americans are concerned about raising inflation. USA President Joe Biden said that he and many Americans are angry and concerned after Kyle Rittenhouse was found not guilty by a jury Friday at his closely watched trial on all charges related to him killing two unarmed men and shooting an armed man during a protest in Cornisha, Wisconsin, last year. More details about this topic in this paper. President Joe Biden expressed the anger and concern he and many Americans feel over Kylie Rittenhouse's acquittal for killing two men and wounding a third. Yet he also expressed his respect to the jury's decision in which he said that it must be abide by. The president asked for calmness in Kenosha, Wisconsin, understanding the strong emotions that led to civil disturbance and which authorities anticipate could return after Rittenhouse acquittal after his shootings last year. I stand by what the jury has concluded. The jury system works and we have to abide by it. The information gauge gross courage. Kyle Rittenhouse was proven not guilty for all allegations related with the shootings of three individuals in August 2020, two of whom were killed. Teenagers' attorney stated that the teen was acting in self-defense when he opened fire. Rittenhouse, then 17 years old, went to Kenosha during the protest that erupted after police shot and wounded Jacob Blake. He claimed that he intended to assist in the protections of local businesses and the provision of first aid. The teenager approached the crowd with an AR-15-style rifle and shot three individuals. 
The jury, which was made up of seven women and five men, deliberated for three and a half days and heard from more than 13 witnesses over two weeks of testimony, acquitted Kyle on all counts. H. Rittenhouse not guilty. As the not guilty verdict was read late Friday, Kyle wept and hugged his attorney. The teenager had been charged with five counts, including first degree intentional homicide, which carries a life sentence. Six over here who had a, a, a very difficult job of. U.S. State Department said that the United States and Taiwan will hold next week the second session of an economic dialogue launched last year in the face of increasing pressure on the island from China. The details with Islam Seed. The United States and Taiwan will hold an economic prosperity partnership dialogue on Monday, led by the U.S. Undersecretary for Economic Growth, Energy and the Environment, led by the U.S. Undersecretary for Economic Growth, Energy and the Environment. According to the State Department, it will be the second session of an economic dialogue launched last year in response to China's increasing pressure on the island. On Monday, U.S. Ambassador Jose Fernandez will lead the second U.S.-Taiwan Economic Affluence Partnership Dialogue. It stated that the dialogue would be held under the auspices of the American Institute in Taiwan and the Taipei Economic and Cultural Representative Office in the United States, both of which serve as an unofficial embassies. The partnership is based on strong two-way trade and investment, people-to-people -people ties, and a shared defense of freedom and democratic values. Science and technology, a global supply chain, renewable energy and global health were among the topics covered during the most recent dialogue. Taiwan hopes that the dialogue will eventually lead to a free trade agreement with the U.S. A last year's inaugural meeting was hailed as a step forward. Police in Rotterdam have fired warning shots injuring protesters and riots broke out. A demonstration against government's plan to impose restrictions on unvaccinated people. Nabi Khazini will report. This is how Rotterdam looked like yesterday. Crowds of rioters in the Dutch port city of Rotterdam have torched cars and thrown rocks at police who responded with warning shots and water cannons. The result? Seven people were wounded and more than 80 were arrested. Ahmed Abu Talib, mayor of Rotterdam, said police were obliged to use their forces against protesters. Rioters heavily attacked the police at different points in time and the police were forced to draw their weapons and even fired direct shots. Asked to describe the situation, Abu Talib condemned it, saying it was an orgy of violence. Um, an orgy of violence. I can't think of another way to describe it. To control the situation, the Dutch police issued a state of emergency in Rotterdam, shutting down public transportation and ordering people to go home. Protesters had gathered here to voice opposition to government plans to restrict access to indoor venues to people who have a corona pass, showing they have been vaccinated or already recovered from an infection. The imposed partial lockdown in the Netherlands followed up a sharp rise in COVID cases, the highest number of infections since the start of the pandemic. In the same line of thought, thousands of demonstrators took rallies to the streets of cities around Australia today, Saturday as part of an international day of protests against COVID-19 mandatory vaccinations and lockdown measures, while smaller crowds gathered to support these measures. Zara Farjani, on what follow? Several thousand people gathered in Australia's streets on Saturday to protest against COVID-19 vaccination mandates. Demonstrators held panels as they marched down streets in Melbourne, Sydney and Adelaide. This is a warning to Dominic, Perrottet, Scomo, you have just woken the sleeping beast. On the other hand, smaller crowds voicing pro-vaccination messages met the anti-lockdown and mandate protesters. By the late afternoon, no violence had been reported from any of the events. We can't make informed decisions. We feel that the government is making the, the, the decisions for us. And that's really not fair. To date, nearly 85% of Australians aged 16 and above have been fully vaccinated against COVID-19 
While nationwide vaccinations are voluntary, states and territories have mandated vaccinations for many occupations and barred the unvaccinated from activities such as dining out and concerts. A probe into suspected human rights breaches during Philippine President Rodrigo Duterte's anti-drug campaign has been postponed by the International Criminal Court's head prosecutors. It is worth mentioning that many have been executed by law enforcement agencies with the president's sanction. Firefighters and doctors walk out of strike after the French overseas territory of Guadalupe has been put under surfoy after five days of civil unrest and violence. The basis of the unrest is due to government imposed COVID-19 protocols that have seen barriers bound in the streets. Morabli war again. Alexandre Rochat's office said on Twitter, in light of the social unrest and acts of vandalism, the prefect of Guadeloupe has decided to impose a curfew. Trade unions launched an indefinite strike on Monday. The protest of compulsory vaccinations of health workers against COVID-19 and health pass requirements after Guadeloupe's prefect Alexandre Rochat, who represents the government at the Caribbean archipelago, said, the nightly curfew would run from 6 p.m. to 5 a.m. The sale of gas in jerry cans would also be forbidden, he added. Protesters have tortured cars and erected makeshift barriers across streets. Video on social media showed police changing protesting firefighters who used fire hoses to try and repel the officers and plumes of smoke raising over neighborhoods. France will be sending over 200 police to the island after the demonstration turned violent, with barricades being turned over and fires being set, including cars which could lead to explosive dangerous consequences. In a joint statement made by French Interior Minister Gérald Dermanon and Overseas Minister Sébastien Lecornu, both officials agreed and stated that they strongly condemned the violence and has taken place in the last few hours in Guadeloupe. The ex-Georgian leader Mikhail Saakashvili has agreed to end a 15-day hunger strike in prison that had raised political tension in the former Soviet Republic and worried the United States. Saakashvili agreed to end his strike on Friday after authorities offered to move him to a military hospital from a prison. Move to be clarified in this report. Saakashvili was arrested on October 1st after returning from exile to rally the opposition on the eve of local election. Saakashvili was moved to a military hospital from a prison hospital after fainting on Thursday, and doctors had urged the authorities to move him to a regular clinic. The rights commissioner had said that Saakashvili was not receiving the appropriate medical treatment and needed to be moved to intensive care to avoid the risk of heart failure, internal bleeding and coma after more than a month and a half on hunger strike. His case has drawn thousands of his supporters onto the streets in recent weeks and raised political tensions in the country of 3.7 million people. Georgia's president Zorabechvili stated that Saakashvili's health must be under close supervision, despite the fact that he himself has made the decision to go on a hunger strike and is trying to lead the process. <laughs> Everyone is equal before the law, but while serving a sentence and while in prison, an ex-president is not and cannot be an ordinary prisoner. He is a special prisoner because everyone, our society just like our international friends, observe his condition and demands the highest standards. The image of our country is reflected in how we treat him and how his dignity, health and safety will be protected. According to media sources, the U.S. on Thursday urged Georgia to treat Saakashvili fairly and with dignity, and it was closely following his situation. After the UK Home Minister Patti Pato announced to the British press that his country designed Hamas resistance group in Palestine as terrorist organization, Palestinian faction in Gaza Strip have called on the British Parliament to overturn this government decision or need that this would constitute a green light to continue its aggression and crimes against Palestinian people, which is the responsibility of the British government for the first place. The detail is normal. Palestinian factions in the Gaza Strip have called on the British Parliament to overturn a government decision. 
to designate resistance group Hamas as a terrorist organization. This came in a press conference held by the factions in Gaza after a meeting to discuss Britain's attempt to pass a law in the parliament designating Hamas as a terrorist organization. UK Home Secretary Priti Patel said Friday she had banned Hamas as a terrorist organization. The move, which will be pushed in the UK Parliament next week, could see Hamas supporters and activists face jail terms of up to 14 years. Hamas, which rules the Gaza Strip, slammed the UK ban as a continued aggression on Palestinians and their rights. Palestinian factions said labelling Hamas as a terrorist group gives the Zionist entity a green light to continue its aggression and crimes against Palestinian people, which is the responsibility of the British government. They stress that the decision directly targets and antagonizes the Palestinian people and denies their legitimate rights to struggle for liberation from occupation. Earlier Saturday, the Palestinian Authority rejected the British move to designate Hamas as a terrorist organization. The UK has banned Hamas armed wing, the Qassam Brigades, as a terrorist organization in 2001, but did not include the group's political bureau within the designation. The UN Security Council condemned in the strongest terms the instruction and seizure on the no-close U.S. embassy in Yemen's capital and detention of thousands of local employees by the country's healthy rebels. A statement approved by all 15 members of the United Nations most powerful body called for an immediate withdrawal of a healthy element from the premises and immediate and safe release of those still under the chance. U.S. State Department spokesman Ned Price told reports last week that diplomatic efforts have succeeded in securing the release of most detained employees, but some of them remain in custody. He said then that work has continued to free others. Thousands of people were demonstrating against insecurity when they learned that from Côte d'Ivoire, a convey of the French army was to cross Burkina Faso to Niger. They blocked the passage because despite the agreement signed with France, it continued the record deaths and the countries remain under arm, as they put it. The details in what follow. Thousands of people rallied in Kaya, Burkina Faso's north central city on Friday to protest the passing of a massive French army supply convoy on its way to Niger. French troops get out, free the sale, and no more French invasion and recolonization military convoy were among the slogans and manners carried out by protesters gathering before Kaya's gate. The convoy's progress had previously been delayed by demonstrations in Bobo di Olasso on Wednesday and Thursday. And then in the capital, Ouagadougou, where Burkinab security forces had to deploy tear gas to disperse the crowds. Hundreds of people demonstrated in several cities across the country on Tuesday, demanding Burkinab President Rachmar Christian Kabore's resignation for his inability to stop terrorist attacks two days after jihadist attacks in Inara, in the country's north, which killed at least 53 people, including 49 gendarmes. Since 2015, Burkina Faso has been subjected to regular and fatal jihadist attacks, notably in the north and east, in the so-called Three Borders region, which borders Mali and Niger, both of which are undergoing violent jihadist operations. An estimated 2,000 people have died as a result of the violence, which is occasionally intermingled with intercommunal conflicts. Millions of Syrians face a new crisis, limited access to safe water, which had degenerated food insecurity, harm, livelihood, and promoted greater immigration in search of resources. The causes are both natural and man-made, see Islam reports. According to United Nations assessment, drought-like conditions have developed in the region as a result of less water coming into the river from upstream, as well as irregular and reduced rainfall and higher than average temperatures. For several analysts, the severity of the crisis in Syria is largely due to the influence of climate change in the region. The actual Syrian crisis is closely linked to the influence of climate change since the country has a semi-arid climate where droughts might be coming in the area. Syria's water crisis has been aggravated by the UN Action Plan. Water shortage has devastated crops, agricultural livelihoods, limited food access, and driven up food and basic commodity costs significantly. At least 12.4 Syrians are food insecure, a number that will only climb as the drought continues, as will malnutrition rates. 
People who have already been relocated may be compelled to move again owing a lack of water, food and other necessities. As the COVID-19 pandemic continues, the water crisis has increased. The incidence of waterborne disease putting further strain on Syria's public health system. The water issue is another challenge for Syrians as they strive to reclaim a feeling of normalcy following decades of strife. Syrians are now under greater pressure and uncertainty. Ethiopian Saturday day hailed the return of Valo in fact looted by British soldiers more than 150 years ago after a long campaign for the restitution. The collection recovered from Britain, Belgium and Netherlands includes a ceremonial crown, an imperial shield, a set of silver, and both horn drinking cup, handwriting, prayers, book, crossword, and necklace. Most of the items were plundered by the British army after a defeat Emperor Tudor II in the Battle of Magdala in 1868 in what was then Abyssinia. The treasure were unwrapped before the media at Ethiopia's National Museum on Saturday, more than two months after they were formally handed over ceremony in London in September. A multitasking smart robot made in Algeria, railing sending details about the problem deeply from and that the soul are among several functionality, functionalities that this intervention offers an invention which shows the progress Algerian inventors are making in the field of artificial intelligence. Nabil reports. A multitasking robot directed to install and pursue the exploitation of gas pipelines. The robot is smart to an extent that it can also repair damages without any single human intervention. We are presenting the Industry 4.0 through a different product. One of the products is a robot that we use for the pipeline inspection so we can get the data in real time plus an image in real time so we can, the philosophy of such product is not to send people to a risky area. You send the robot, you bring the data, you take decision. The robot identifies gas leak points repair disruptions, even those discovered deeply underground. Qualities that give flexibility and speed for local communities to immediately intervene with less efforts and less expenses. We made this robot to tell the world that we also can invent robots. We're capable to make robots. The problem is not only with emissions. Take the example of municipalities' interventions team. Whenever they have a drill mission, they feel unable to detect the real problem. A small robot like this one sends very exact details about the distance and the nature of the problem. More than that, the robot sends solutions for the problem located underground. Drilling can be avoided and the emission can be accomplished much easier. An Algerian smart robot made with Algerian hands competes countries that made long steps in the robotic field. An invention that will lessen risks for energy companies, minimize expenses, and will help manage repair deadlines. Ending up with some light news about the British royal family, where the, the beautiful girl of Cambridge, Kat Middleton, has streamed social media and royal family fans with her new hairstyle look at royal royalty performance. Now they cast me on what follow. The Duchess of Cambridge wowed royal fans when she arrived at the royal variety performance alongside husband Prince William Thursday night with her gorgeous hair transformation. Dazzling in a custom-made Jenny Packham gown, which she previously wore to a reception hosted by the British High Commissioner to Pakistan in 2019, Kate's glamorous evening look was enhanced by her brand new hairdo. She wore her long brunette locks, swept over one shoulder, ditching her trademark bouncy blow-dry in favor of natural tangled curls. Duchess Kate's new hairstyle marks a huge change in her public image. Her look has been achieved using a smaller curling iron with the emphasis on creating more volume and a more natural look. Kate's decision to change up her hair look gave her more polished image and makes her more authentic in the eyes of royal fans. And after all, Kate is right on trend for the autumn and winter season.
And before we wrap up our news, let's have a reminder of our main stories. Hundreds of protesters gather in Portland to condemn the decision declared Carrie House not guilty. Thousands of demonstrators of Australia and Netherlands against COVID-19 mandatory vaccination. Again, thousands of demonstrations block French convoy in Burkina Faso and protest against insecurity and French army. Ladies and gentlemen, that's all what we have for now. Thank you so much for being with us. Take care and have a nice evening.